Before talking about the Syrian civil war, you first have to know what the Arab Spring is. The Arab Spring was a series of protests and civil unrest that spread through North Africa to the Middle East and authoritative Muslim countries. The protests started in 2010 in Tunisia when Mohamed Bouazizi, a street vendor, used self-immolation as an act of protest after an agent of the autocratic regime of Tunisia confiscated his wares and harassed him. Zine El Abidin Ben Ali, the president of Tunisia of 23 years, stepped down after a series of protests led by the citizens of Tunisia. Successful countries like Tunisia that were a part of the Arab Spring protests include Oman, Morocco, and Jordan. All of these countries went from restrictive and inefficient inefficient monarchies to making vital changes in government to give legislative bodies power other countries that weren't so successful that participate that participated in the arab spring protests include libya yemen and syria now these countries are involved in long-lasting civil wars that have resulted in thousands of deaths the protest in Syria started after 15 boys, aged 10 to 16, were arrested and tortured after spray painting Ashab Yorid Eskat El Nizam across one of their school walls. This phrase had became the motto for the Arab Spring protest, which translates to the people want to topple the regime. After being caught by the secret police of Dara, the, the boys were then tortured for the vandalism. This was the spark that ignited the revolution of the Syrians, but it was not the only factor. The Syrians have had to deal with a series of nepotism and lack of political freedom under the Assad regime, dating all the way back from the 1960s when Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad's father, took control of the government in Ekurita. Since then, the Syrian government's constitution states that there is freedom of the press, but under the state of emergency order, which was in effect from 1961 to 2011, when the Ba'ath Party took control of the government, the freedom has been restricted enormously. Even after the order was repealed, the censorship has not stopped, but gotten worse, with the government wanting to put out an image that Assad is trying to fight off terrorists. Syrians do not have access to Western media, and as television is the easiest way for them to receive news, they must rely on it. Strict controls on news outlets is evident by the fact that the three biggest magazines are state-operated. This shows that the media Syrians consume is filled with pro-government propaganda, and that their ability to gain access to unbiased news is restricted. Nepotism is when people in power choose to grant positions to family members or friends. Bashar al-Assad acti actively practices nepotism in his regime and even came into power through his, father's practicing, through his father practicing nepotism. After his father died in 2000, the constitution of Syria was amended to lower the minim minimum age for the presidency from 40 to 34. He was also elected that year with a 97% approval, which was reported from a state-run media agency. This is an obvious example of almost monarchy-like behavior and proves that Syria is not a democratic state and the people's right to elect their own leader is suppressed. Examples of nepotism shown in today's Syria is how President Bashar appoints leaders of offices high up in the Syrian government. They're not appointed based on skill or experience, and they most certainly don't have the best of the people or country in mind. They are appointed based on loyalty to the regime, they are family members, and people who have been affiliated with the family ever since they came into power. Their sole goal is to keep the Assad family in power and suppress the will of the people. Bashar al-Assad's younger brother, Maher al-Assad, is the head of the Republican Guard. The Republican Guard was sent in when protests started in the city of Dara and put down the protesters, killing dozens. With this level of oppression, the Syrian people were ignited to rebel. The Syrian civil war grew out of decades of oppression and persecution, all to keep the Assad family in power. The Arab Spring protests were just the flames that ignited the powder keg and eventually set off open rebellion in various regions across, Syria's, in, across Syria with various groups participating. There are four main groups participating 
and the Syrian civil war for their own interest outside of the Syrian government and the Syrian rebels. They are Russia, Iran, the Kurdish, and the United States. To begin with, Iran. The Middle East is home to many unusual alliances, but one of the oddest is the enduring partnership between Syria and Iran. Syria portrays itself as a champion of secular Arab nationalism, although in practice it is a minority-dominated military dictatorship. Iran, in contrast, rides under the banner of revolutionary Islam, although as a Persian country, it is often at odds with the Arab world, particularly since the vast majority of Iranians are Shiites, most Arabs are Sunnis. Syrian President Bashar Assad's father and predecessor, Hafez Assad, gunned down thousands of revolutionary Islamists in the 1970s and early 80s to prevent an Islamic revolution in Syria. Iran's religious elite has often criticized Arab leaders as despots who have turned away from true Islam, a description that could easily apply to Assad, Syria. But geopolitics has brought Iran and Syria together despite many of these differences. In a strategic partnership that would have made Metternich proud, the two nations banded together against Saddam's Iraq, which both saw as, as an immediate threat to their security. Israel, too, provided a common foe. Iran's revolutionary ideology saw Israel, Israel as an anathema. Syria also opposed the Jewish state, especially after its humiliating defeat in the 1967 war, since when it has strived to regain the Golan Heights. The United States is hostile to both regimes, producing further incentive to cooperate. Both countries worry that the chaos in Iraq will creep across their borders, but they're also keen for the United States to suffer a bloody nose to dampen its enthusiasm for re regime change. Finally, both nations have few allies, making the other's support especially valuable. Secondly, the United States. Obama wanted to shrink the U.S. military footprint in, middle, in the Middle East and resisted pressure to take military action in the wake of Syria's 2011 uprising. He never ordered an attack against the Syrian government itself, but Obama did launch the bombing campaign against the Islamic State as it rapidly expanded in 2014. His aim was to defeat ISIS on the battlefield and seek a negotiated political deal with Assad. Obama's air war made progress against ISIS, but peace efforts with Assad went nowhere. The Trump administration has offered mixed messages about its commitment to attacking Syria after chemical attacks. We are prepared to sustain this response until the Syrian regime stops its use of prohibited chemical agents, President Donald Trump said from the White House on Friday night. But soon after, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis gave a different assessment. Right now, this is a one-time shot, Mattis said, designed to set back the Syrian war machine's ability to produce chemical weapons. He did note the increased scale of the strikes compared to last year's attack. This time with our allies, we have struck harder, Mattis said. Together we have sent a clear message to Assad and his murderous lieutenants that they should not perpetrate another chemical weapons attack. Possibly Syria's biggest ally is Russia. Moscow wants to keep Assad, its closest ally in the Middle East, in power and secure its military influence in the region. It has an important military air base in the western province of Latakia and a naval base in the Syrian port of Tartus. Russian leaders support a peace deal with the broad consensus among Syria's moderate factions that would allow Assad to remain in power. It has also hinted it may support limited autonomy for opposition forces in certain regions within Syria. Russia has launched airstrikes against ISIS in the northeast provinces of Syria, but contradictory reports state that Russia has targeted rebel, rebel groups as well. Finally, the Kurds. The Kurds are ethnic minority in northeast Syria and South Turkey. The Kurds have been displaced and are fighting for their own place in northern Syria. In mid-2013, the jihadist group Islamic State turned its sights on three Kurdish enclaves that border territory under its control in northern Syria. It launched repeated attacks that until mid-2014 were repelled by the People's Protection Units, the YPG, the armed wing of the Syrian Kurdish Democratic Union Party. An IS advance in northern Iraq in, two th in June 2014 also drew that country's Kurds into conflict. The government of Iraq's autonomous region, Kurdistan, re sent its 
Peshmerga forces to areas abandoned by the Iraqi army. As of 2018, 5 million have fled the conflict in Syria, with most going to neighboring countries of Jordan and Lebanon. Hundreds of thousands have fled to Europe and countries including but not limited to Hungary, Serbia, Greece, Italy, and France. There have been social flicks on these countries, such as a rise in political ideologies concerning closing borders. There has also been economic problems, such as funding being cut for food for the refugees. Ethnic enclaves have also started to emerge in major cities, such as Paris. Some say that the massive influx of refugees will have a dramatic impact on the economy for the worse. They claim that the housing, medical needs, and general financial will cost hundreds of thousands on taxpayers. However, on the flip side of the argument, some would say that the increase of government spending will increase aggregate demand and therefore stimulate the economy in the short term. This is shown by three countries who have taken in large amounts of immigrants and have seen their GDP grow by small percentages, Austria, Germany, and Sweden. The question is posed, though, is this correlation or causation? The negative side also argues that the refugees are not guaranteed to stay in the host country, which will just be a monetary loss to the government of said country, or that the refugees will not fully integrate into the society and will not seek skilled employment. This could possibly just drain the country's money further. Social effects in Europe have also started to take notice. Countries such as France and Hungary have had an increase in popularity of right-wing politics. This is unusual for European countries considering the fact that most are socialist in nature. Calls to close borders have run across Europe by upstart politicians such as Marine Le Pen of France. Hungary has actually closed its borders with neighboring countries like Croatia and Serbia to curb the influx of refugees. No matter what your political ide ideology is, it's universally accepted that the Syrian civil war is a humanitarian disaster with the country's own leader Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons to murder his own people. This has caused many to flee the country, and some even risking their lives and dying on the way there, fleeing Syria on rafts to try to make it to countries such as Italy, Greece, and North Northern Africa. Undoubtedly, there is still a lot that wasn't covered because the Syrian civil war is such a complex global issue. However, we hope to bring you a general overview with this documentary to inform you about the crisis at hand. No matter where you are on the globe, you will most likely be affected by the Syrian civil war.